throughout and then we're going to make a little bit of time at the end to go through answering those so i believe the recording is now in progress yep. great so just going back then um to the slides so courtney gave a, a nice introduction there um and I suppose some of this training came around myself and Oscar have been connecting over the last couple of months um, in some of my work as in an OT in the disability service. I couldn't help but notice some of the transgender students who I was meeting with, um, you know, and their unique challenges compared to their peers. So I think it is important that we do consider the needs of these students in particular. And then hopefully the session today will give us a bit of insight into how we can go about doing that. So I believe, Courtney, you have a QR code here for a survey. Yeah, so if everyone, everybody could either you can scan the QR code if you have, say, an iPhone or you can go onto your browser onto menti.com and use the code 72543499. I'll put them details into the chat now. So if everybody could just fill that out and then I'll share the results. And you can be as honest as you can. That'd be great. Thank you. OK, so this is just at the beginning for us to get a little bit of context um, as to how much some of you might already know about transgender issues. Um, and then hopefully we can provide a little bit more insight today. So I'll wait a, more, a few more seconds for everybody to get the QR code down there. But it's also in the chat box just while everybody is filling in their answers i'm going to just run through the outline for today's session so we're going to just look at an introduction and background to some statistics and demographics of this population we're going to have a, a brief intro to the tcd gender identity and expression policy we're going to look at some terminology oscar is going to give us a good background then we're going to look at recognising and managing biases that some of us may have as a first step towards change. We're going to look at some common beliefs that we may have as staff members and how we can challenge these or view them from a different perspective. Then Oscar is going to take us through some, some great ideas and examples for how we can be an ally. So there's some nice concrete suggestions there, what we can do. Then we're going to just provide a brief overview of some of the Trinity student societies and services that are already available for supporting transgender students. And it's really useful that we are all aware of those and how to connect students in. And then following some of Oscar's recommendations for how to be an ally, we're going to look at making effective allyship commitments that look towards some more long term change and continuous development. And lastly, Oscar and Courtney have kindly put together some further resources and recommendations if anyone's interested in looking further into this topic after today's session. OK, so OK, that's perfect. I'm going to share my screen so you can see the results. Um, so hopefully you can all see that there so as we can see with all four of the sections so how confident are you in understanding trans students needs we have 43 so we're still on the more unconfident side uh, talking about trans issues 42 and engaging in the conversation with trans students is 48 so a bit higher than the first two questions and understanding the tcd gender identity and gender expression policy is 31 so the average is 41 so yeah um this training will definitely uh help maybe in the confidence and i was meant to say there's a second question to answer near around the end of the the presentation so i think if you can still maybe i can see there's a few answers already so um you can answer again if you haven't near around the end of the presentation okay, okay i'll just okay. stop sharing my screen Great, thanks Courtney. So it's just useful, I suppose, to set the scene a little bit um, to gather where everybody is at. So just coming back then to talk a little bit about some of the, I suppose, the demographics um, and in terms of looking at 
population size, first of all, for some context. So data collected from various sources, such as the 2016 census, as well as polls and surveys, have shown that on average between 3 to 10 percent of people in Ireland are LGBTI plus, and that was collected from belong to. So if we look somewhere in the middle of, of that percentage at 7%, so if 7% of those that we meet are LGBTI+, plus, then out of the 18,000 students in Trinity, that would mean 1,260 or there around of those are LGBTI+. Plus. So that means that most of us will be working or coming across students who are LGBTI+, plus, which really just highlights the importance of us having competencies in working with students and other people in this community. So Oscar is going to talk to us a bit more about the background. Hello, I'm Oscar for the sake of saying it. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm currently coming from Amsterdam. I'm, I've just finished my master's studies today. So I've got a little bit of like excited energy. So forgive me for that. Um, so the background and population of the trans students within Trinity or within Ireland in general, it's hard to say because there's no official estimate uh, of how many transgender people there are in the country. Roughly 7% of the population are LGBT+, and then maybe 500 people in Ireland have already gained their gender recognition certificate, which isn't to say there's only 500 trans people in Ireland, there's far more, uh, just only 500 or so of them have officially legally changed their gender. Um, another statistic that's a little bit uh, upsetting, but it's always important to remember, is that the transgender population are far more likely to experience mental ill health and physical distress directly related to experiences of being transgender. 41% um, of the population of trans people will attempt suicide at some point in their life. That's an old statistic from 2016. I would argue that it's probably much higher at this point, and that's directly related to the rise in transphobia, both on the internet and in person. That's been the topic of my master's thesis was uh, transphobia on the internet. Uh, in Ireland at the moment, if somebody wants to engage in medical transition, there are very limited uh, avenues for that person to do so. There is no surgical intervention option for transgender people at the moment. Uh, there used to be one surgeon. She's gone now. Uh, people are being referred to uh, the UK. And even at that, there are very few surgeries available. There's currently no uh, lower surgery or penile re reconstruction surgery for transgender men available either in the UK or in Ireland. So we're having to go further afield for life-saving medical care. Uh, in Ireland, there's currently a 2.5 year wait to be uh, to gain your first appointment with the gender identity uh, clinic. And there's only one clinic in Ireland that covers all of us. It's a critically oversubscribed, underfunded and poorly managed system that everybody has to engage with. And it takes a very long time to engage with. There are no provisions for people under the age of 18. Uh, in terms of like an administrative transition. So that would mean like changing your documents, changing your name legally, changing your gender. Um, it's possible to do those things. It's possible to change your gender in Ireland, but there is no recognition for non-binary or a neutral gender marker. So you either have to pick male or female, which doesn't reflect a large portion of the population. Uh, it's not possible for anybody uh, under the age of 16 to achieve this without a court case. And between the ages of 16 and 18, it's equally as complicated. Current estimates say that roughly one in 10 young people will identify as non-binary. And I think that's important to say because it's going to be uh, an emergent population in the Trinity uh, in Trinity student life. There's going to be more trans people coming in more in uh, upcoming years. There's going to be more non-binary people. So it's vital that we start preparing for this population and serving them appropriately. Like jump to the next slide. Great, so I'm just going to jump in quickly on just the, the policies. So mainly the Trinity College Dublin gender identity and gender expression policy. So as we could see from the survey Courtney shared earlier, I think it was 31% of us felt confident and knowledgeable um, of this policy. And I suppose the policy outlines the college's formal commitment to recognize and support an individual's gender identity and gender expression so that all members of the college community experience a positive and inclusive environment where every member is treated with dignity and respect. So I think it's very important, you know, as a staff member within Trinity that we are familiar with this policy as it does a really good job of outlining what our role can be in supporting students who are transgender, whether that is supporting a student through the name changing process or going there. They have a nice checklist of how a staff member can support a student on their transition journey while managing, you know, the typical demands of college. So would highly recommend to go and, and familiarize yourselves with that. 
and the policy um, was informed by the Equal Status Act, which prohibits discrimination in the provision of goods and services, accommodation and education. And this act covers nine grounds, which include gender and sexual orientation. So with that background in mind, then I'm just going to hand it back to Oscar to take us through some of the terminology. Yeah, so there's a lot of words that uh, in my work I take as uh, granted that everybody understands and a couple of concepts that I assume a lot of people already know about. But this uh, diagram here is a really good uh, baseline for understanding a lot of this. So it's the gender unicorn. Uh, so it divides different modes of identity into categories. So you have your gender identity, which is often referred to as the internal experience of gender. Everybody has a gender identity. People who have no gender identity also have a gender identity of null. So that, try and get your head around that one a little bit. Uh, in general, people will view gender on a binary of male through female, but really it's more like a big circle and you can put yourself anywhere in the circle. Uh, gender expression is generally understood as how you present your gender to the world. So in traditional ways, like I grow a beard because it's a masculine presentation that uh, fulfills my uh, gender. Uh, sex assigned at birth is exactly what it says in the tin. It's when you are born, you are assigned a, a, a sex. Uh, of, oftentimes people are also assigned intersex, which uh, we'll get to a slide on that in a second. And then physical attraction and then emotional attraction, those two things sort of come together to form sexual attraction. Those things are uh, distinct but linked. It's uh, important to understand that uh, a lot of trans people that you're interacting with will have a pretty nuanced understanding of their themselves. And uh, it, it's beneficial to come uh, ready and open to experience what they already believe about themselves. So if you jump to the next slide. So in very plain terms, gender identity is your internal sense of gender, male, female, both, neither, otherwise. A lot of people have uh, fluctuating gender identities. One morning they'll feel something, one afternoon they'll feel something else. Some commonly used phrases, uh, transgender and cisgender, both of those come from Latin, trans meaning across and cis meaning, uh, I think it means stay or stationary. I'm more interested in the trans. So transgender meaning across gender and cisgender is you stay, you stay stationary in your gender. So individuals whose gender identity is different from their sex given at birth or their uh, identified sex is incongruous with their gender identity are referred to as transgender. Uh, Non-binary is also under the umbrella term of transgender. Uh, it's, it's for people who don't identify as exclusively male or female or possibly on any binary at all. Um, so down to the next one, uh, gender expression. As I said, it's an external manifestation of your gender identity. So through mannerisms, grooming, physical appearances, social interactions and speech patterns. Um, and I'll jump to the next one again. And then this is uh, sexual orientation. I think a lot of people have a, a pretty solid grasp on what this is. So it's your capacity to experience attraction, emotional and sexual attraction. Uh, there's people who are transgender also have sexual orientations. Transgender is not in and of itself a sexual orientation. It's more of an, uh, a personal identity. So while I am transgender, I am also queer. I am also gay. I am also whatever else it is. And then, as I said earlier, the extra one there, uh, intersex is a word which represents a spectrum of external or internal sexual characteristic differences. So an intersex person may have ambiguous genitalia or hormonal differences. Being intersex is different from uh, all of these categories as it's not particularly uh, an identity that you can choose to have. You either are or are not intersex. I'm also intersex on top of being transgender. Um, which is different to my sexual attraction. So I sort of come with three different circles of things that I tend to talk about um, and then jump down to the next one again. So what we're going to talk about um, in terms of managing bias really comes from this world of cis normativity and heteronormativity. Because we live in a world where the hegemony of society are cisgender, straight, uh, oftentimes white, those three things tend to inform all social mores and like how the world tends to operate. So there is like a normalization or a belief that there are certain ways to be right. And then anything that diverges from that is abnormal. So coming from that, these two beliefs mark LGBT people like broadly as a minority and they act as a barrier to receiving proper healthcare support and a variety of other things that people need to be able to interact wholly with society. And then I'll throw it back over to you. 
Thank you, Oscar, for, for running through some of the terminology there. So this slide is going to address recognising bias within ourselves. And this is a really important first step, I suppose, the title of the training is awareness. So this is a really important first step to building awareness. And I suppose talking about implicit bias first, as humans, we can subconsciously view others who are different from ourselves as unsafe. And this can mean that we may carry subconscious thoughts about others that don't necessarily represent or reflect our conscious beliefs. So that really is what implicit bias means. So an example on, on the slide here of what an implicit bias might look like is that one in four of us believe that being LGBTI plus is a choice and that openly discussing it may wrongly cause young people to think that they are LGBTI plus. So I think it's important to say most people aren't prejudiced on purpose. Most people don't exhibit explicit biases. And I suppose looking towards our implicit bias, if we take time to really look beyond our gut opinions and work them out and rationalize them, we can learn to combat the implicit biases we may have and to treat others more fairly, seeing them as equal to ourselves. So I suppose Oscar is going to take us through what we call micro communications, and this just really highlights how implicit bias can impact our daily interactions with others. So imagine yourself for a second, you are a transgender person interacting with the world. Every single time you're interacted with, there's a possibility for uh, being exposed to some sort of microcommunication and microaggression, which comes in the next slide. So microcommunications is understood as treating others differently because of an unconscious bias that can result in microaggressions. So we may be less welcoming to someone, we may make comments about how someone looks or acts. It even could be intended as a compliment, but it is uh, still manifesting as a microaggression. So microaggressions can be commonplace in our daily interactions. You may consider it to be harmless banter, but uh, it, when you're constantly being exposed to microaggressions and you're constantly carrying them, it does wear you down. It can affect your self-esteem, it can affect your mental health, and it, it's hard to say what thing is going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. So if we just jump to the next slide, there's uh, a couple of, there's tiers that I understand of microaggressions. So it comes from the smallest thing, so the micro insult. So someone may say, I never would have guessed you are trans. People say this to me all of the time. Um, this isn't a compliment. There's nothing good about not looking trans because that also implies that trans people look a certain way. Um, it implies that trans people act a certain way. It implies that we're uh, clockable, which is uh, to be able to see that somebody is transgendered just by looking at them and not interacting with them. It's important that uh, when you are trying to compliment a transgender person, we don't say, you, I never would have guessed you looked trans. Then there's a, a second uh, area of it, maybe a micro invalidation. So as an example, a transgender man is directed towards a gender neutral facility, even though he identifies as male and it is more appropriate for him to use a male facility. Uh, the implication of that micro invalidation is that he should use non-gendered facilities because his male identification isn't valid. And then on a third level, a micro assault is something a little bit more um, upfront. So let's say a student sits in class and another student or staff member makes a transphobic comment or engages with a discussion that validates transphobic ideology as worthy of civilized debate. So let's say we're in a seminar room and someone says uh, sex is unchangeable and sex and gender are the same thing. Validating that um, rhetoric as a valid argument without challenging it for its transphobia can be deeply hurtful for trans students. So when you're interacting with somebody who is transgender and you see that they're massively stressed, you see that they're under quite a lot of pressure, ask yourself which comment was it that was the final straw that made this person behave this way. In general, it's the smallest thing that you may not have even noticed. You may have thought you were complimenting somebody, but what you've actually done is torn their identity asunder and removed any sense of social uh, safety that they have. I think jump to the next one, I think we'll go back to you. Yeah, great. So I suppose now that we have a good overview of bias and the really significant impact that it can have on somebody, it's very important that we look at how we can manage this and some changes and considerations we can make going forward. So first of all, I think it's important, you know, to, to put it back on yourself and actually to look after yourself and your own well-being so that you can be present and mindful in your interactions with others. So 
you know, if you are not feeling well or you're stressed out, it could very much lead you to act less kindly towards somebody else that you're dealing with or to perhaps be a little bit less patient. So, you know, if you find it hard to manage this stress, practicing mindfulness can be great. There are lots of apps available such as Headspace. Um, and I know the, the TCD, the Employee Assistance Program here, does have some sort of platforms for managing well-being and things like that through, through HR. So that's kind of a first point to stress. The second point here is individuate. This means focusing on the individual in front of you and the subject at hand. So being transgender is only one aspect of a person. You know, it's really important that you notice the other traits about the individual and you know what they're coming to you for. So for example, are they an anxious first year student who's having difficulty managing an online system or getting their student card? Um, you know, are they a society president who's trying to book a room to arrange an event? So focusing on these other traits is really important as well, rather than always focusing on the individual's gender and sexuality. The third point here is try not to infantilize students. Students are young adults. So again, this comes back to checking in with your own biases or maybe some of your, your own views, you know, that might even stem from your life roles. So perhaps if you are a parent or a carer for somebody that is similar in age to college students, maybe consider does this impact how you're interacting with students that you're meeting with? And, you know, double check, are you viewing the students' opinions and experiences as valid? And it, it, the last point kind of feeds back into some of that in terms of checking your assumptions. And that includes both focusing on someone's gender identity and orientation when it's not relevant to their care or to the topic at hand, and equally ignoring it when it is relevant. So now myself and Oscar are going to, I suppose, go through a bit of a dialogue of some common thoughts or beliefs that we may have as staff members. So I'm going to talk through some of these and Oscar is going to support me to challenge the way I'm viewing it. So I suppose the first one here, I treat everyone the same because I want to treat everyone equally. So we know that equality is not the same as equity and that treating everyone equally is not the same as working inclusively. And minorities such as those in the LGBTI plus community may have specific needs we need to consider. Yes, yeah, so an example of this is uh, all the examples here are things that I have experienced. So uh, let's say it is appropriate and reasonable for me to be directed to male changing facilities in the gym. In the Trinity gym, I was directed to the male changing facilities. But what I need to be safe, secure and happy in this is to understand more about what sort of room I'm about to walk into. Uh, is it, are these changing rooms single stall? Is it open plan? Uh, are there sanitary products in the male uh, restrooms? Is there a bin, even if I were to bring my own? Uh, the idea of treating me equally just by pointing me to that door doesn't actually support me in being able to engage fully. Okay, and another common thought might be that I have not encountered anyone in my practice in this group yet. So as we looked at the demographics earlier, it may not be obvious, but up to 10% of those who you work with are LGBTI+. So don't assume that it will be obvious or that you have not encountered anyone in this community yet. So as you're saying, the best thing is to challenge your beliefs about this population. Not every trans per person will look trans, whatever that means, or not every trans person will look the same. Perhaps there are multiple trans people in your practice already who don't feel like you're a safe harbor to let you know that there's trans. Uh, perhaps you already have friends and acquaintances who are trans who just haven't told you. Maybe they've already like, completed whatever their transition journey is and you just don't know. Uh, it's really the obligation of you to create that space, not for the individual to test the waters of your allyship, because that can be dangerous for people. It can be precarious. And sometimes it's not worth the risk because you may lose a resource. You may lose a support if you uh, come out to somebody and then you realize that they're uh, they're going to disagree with your identity. OK. Next, our next kind of common thought or belief might be that I do not have time to build awareness in this area. This is a, a pretty common thing. Uh, it comes up in most attempts that I have of getting medical care, um, where a GP will immediately notice that you're trans or be told that you're trans and refuse to consider that you're sick from any other avenue other than medical transition. So I could have a cold, but because I'm also taking testosterone, I'm going to be told to stop taking testosterone for a couple of weeks to see if that fixes my cold. 
it, those two things don't link together. Respiratory issues don't link to taking testosterone. I've been on it for years. So engaging with the trans population requires learning, much like any other minority group. And there's a, a dividend of knowledge and actionable allyship that you sort of have to cross. And that requires bridging your fear. Yeah, and I suppose that links us on to the last belief that, that some people may have in terms of lacking confidence or feeling scared of offending somebody and feeling scared or even avoiding discussing this with students. Understandable again that people will feel uncomfortable, that they'll feel uneasy and they don't want to misstep. At the end of the day, most people want to help. Uh, that's great, but it really only protects you. Uh, expect a lot of discomfort, expect being corrected. You have an obligation to try and you have an obligation to be open to being corrected. Across the board, I would prefer to have to correct someone in lieu of not receiving care or feeling like I am supported. If you think you're afraid, then consider how terrified the person across from you is. While you may be afraid of misstepping, they're afraid of like potentially anything like the the murder rate among trans people is much higher than the cis population it's it's a very dangerous thing to be transgender in a lot of ways so there's sort of a navigation of constant vigilance okay so now oscar i believe you're going to talk us through how we can manage this and how we can engage in allyship yeah so first and foremost, you're not expected to be an expert. You're not expected to know everything. I don't know everything. This terminology and this knowledge is constantly evolving. Keeping up with the latest terms is not expected of you every single day. But what is expected is for you to be available, not make assumptions and to be ready to listen and support and to be open to what these people are telling you. Ask yourself why and for who are you doing these things? Are you trying to learn about the transgender community to make you feel better? Or are you trying to learn about the transgender community to help us? We're looking, uh, we're going to look at some suggestions, so some tangible actions. Um, the first and most important thing is to reflect on your own bias, so as we've discussed, and it's quite difficult because people don't like being uncomfortable, but it's absolutely essential that you're able to acknowledge your own biases and work on them before doing anything else. And all of these things combined together, they can be seen as being an ally. So in the next slide, there's a couple of key things that you can say about being an ally. If you wanted to today change your action and start, um, you can start considering yourself an ally. Some key things that you need to do is to be respectful in your communication. So if the situation is appropriate and safe, and if you're unsure what pronoun to use, then you can ask the person how they wish to be identified. You're gonna to have to uh, overview the situation that you're in to see if it's safe. Is it a public setting? Are they then going to be exposing themselves to other people who they possibly weren't prepared to come out to? When you are given that person's pronoun, use it. Don't guess it, don't ignore it. If somebody is transgender, it doesn't mean they use they pronouns. If someone says they use he, him, use he, him. So when you're responding appropriately, that is exactly what I said. When someone's um, uh, gender presentation doesn't match what you expect them to look like, respond to the person that's in front of you, not the piece of paper. You can respectfully inquire and engage as suggested above. And for the most part, I find that people are open to gentle inquiry and they would prefer that to being misgendered. So uh, a key point of allyship is to advocate for changes and to make your service more inclusive. It doesn't do well if all you do is, uh, if all you're doing is being nice to transgender people, you also have to create an environment that supports them. And part of that is calling up yourself and others instead of calling out, calling up is a little bit nicer. So when mistakes are made, um, that happens, it's important for you to acknowledge them, to apologize for them and to work on not doing it again. Nobody leaves a single training as a fully formed activist or ally. No, you're not going to leave this hour totally confident in talking about transgender issues. I hope you'll feel slightly more confident, but this is a process and you have to anticipate some missteps. You have to anticipate checking in on yourself. And so uh, another couple of easy things that you could do is to let students know that they can trust you. Um, you can let people know that your office or your space is a safe space. Put up a rainbow flag somewhere, highlight your pronouns, have poster and literature that are inclusive in the area. There's uh, endless resources that you can print out or have posted to you. If I were to see somebody walking around with a trans pride pin, I would feel safer knowing that this person is near me. Um, <clears throat> another key point is don't think that uh, you have to get people to come out to you. Uh, you have to make your service broadly LGBT inclusive. Uh, you need to 
invite people in instead of asking them to come out. And that requires inclusive language, effective communication, and ensuring that students have a positive experience. Assume that everybody you meet will benefit from a more inclusive environment, regardless of their gender identity. Uh, within document documentation and forms, so does it uh, do, do these forms ask for gender? Do they give space to include your own definition of gender identity, or is it just tick the box? Do you record people's pronouns when you first meet them, or do you even ask? Uh, and another key thing to remember is, is it required on certain forms to ask for gender? Do Is it valuable to what you're doing to know what someone's gender is and to record that on a piece of paper? Or is it more for your interaction with them? In that case, knowing someone's pronouns is more beneficial to knowing their gender identity. And the last key point is to constantly ask yourself, what does meaningful allyship mean? What can you do in your daily life to ensure that people see you as a safe space? It's not a single act, it's a constant way of being. Just like trans people can't take off their transness, at the end of the day, I'm still going to be trans. Our allies can't either. We need people to be constantly fighting for us. And then more into practical allyship. If you look at the, the image on the right, there's uh, sometimes there's confusion about uh, grammatical uh, issues around transgender stuff. So how do we use the word transgender? Uh, the easiest way to talk about it is uh, transgender is not something that uh, happens to a person. It's something that they are. So someone is not transgendered. The word transgender, the paper was yellowed. The person is not transgendered. We're people first. Um, and when we're talking about uh, or original birth assignation, um, you don't, it's it's a little bit of a microaggression to say that he was born a, or she was born a. We use the terminology, they were assigned whatever at birth. Some people also say I was coercively assigned whatever it is at birth. So there's a really, there's a fine line between supportive and inappropriate lines of questioning. If you're concerned about crossing that line, ask yourself, would you ask this question to a cisgender person? Nine times out of 10, you wouldn't ask a cisgender person what's in their pants, so why would you do it to somebody else? Uh, unless you're a doctor who specializes in genitalia, it doesn't really uh, concern you. A major red flag for uh, trans people is hearing incorrect sentence structure around transgender issues. So uh, it's imperative that you learn how to conjugate the word transgender a little bit and to feel more confident in using it in speech. Uh, and then the final point of that um, of that uh, image is, did you get the surgery? That's a major dog whistle because it implies that there is one surgery that you go in, go out, and you're no longer trans, you're cis, your body has been fixed. It's not, that's not how it works. Unless it's part of your job to know about surgeries, you don't ask. Okay, thank you very much, Oscar. Um, and I suppose this slide then just brings it back to specific supports and places that we can connect students into within Trinity. So looking at a mixture of services and societies. So the, the QSOC is a student society, which is open to anybody of under, any um, sexual orientation or gender. And, you know, it's a it's safe space for students to go, particularly if they have interest in queer politics or queer societies. Um, and it's a safe space where students can, you know, talk about their own experiences and share that with each other. Uh, the Trinity College Students Union is has introduced alongside QSOC, introduced a T fund that is there to support students um, to facilitate their social transitioning. So the social transition is what it sounds like, I suppose, in the title, the social aspects where somebody is letting others know about their gender identity, whether that's telling somebody, um, you know, dressing in a certain way or changing it on documentation. And that's what the, the T fund is looking to support. Um, the Trinity Student Counselling Service this past year have held a weekly rainbow group, which was on Wednesdays at 4 p.m. So that was a drop in group, which was another safe space for students to come and I suppose improve their mental health and resilience and supporting each other, but also being supported by the professional group facilitators. And then the student to student or the S2S mentors, again, that's a service provided for students by students. They provide peer support and there are some of the peer mentors that are specifically trained in LGBTQI plus support and then some students that are sharing their own personal experience as well. So it's just useful to be aware. 
and in my time in Trinity, I engaged with the majority of these supports as well. I was really, really benefited by being able to engage with QSOC and the student counselling service. It was the student counselling service, in fact, that was the way that I was able to engage with medical transition because they were able to refer me on to the appropriate services. Um, so in terms of effective allyship, if you were to ask yourself right now, what can I do to make it better? So there's a couple of very basic things that you can do. So do you have uh, pronouns visible on your email signature? You can change those settings right now and in five minutes you'll have it constantly. Do you have clearly visible markers of your allyship in your workspace? Do you have maybe a flag, posters, leaflets, queer art? Um, it's, you can make these things relate to what you're already interested in. I'm interested in queer artists, so I have constant books all over my office as though people didn't know uh, by everything that I talk about how queer I am. So what sort of commitments can you make which will approve your uh, allyship in the next academic year? You have new students coming in, we have your old students coming back, all happening in September. Will you be implementing a regular name and pronoun check-in with your uh, with everyone you interact with? That could be beneficial. And can you commit to attending further trainings? Um, will you commit to uh, downloading some other resource? And then in the long term, how can you go beyond educating yourself and start educating others? Because while you feel like it might not be your space or your place to start educating people on allyship, unless somebody starts making the steps, other people aren't going to start doing it too. And now after sort of uh, for the past couple of minutes, getting an overview of what allyship can mean, um, we're going to ask you to uh, go to the mentee and give us some serious commitments. What can you do? It can be small scale, large scale, whatever you want. Yeah, I just want to say that um, you, if you just even refresh your browser from the last mentee, it should come up. Um, I know there's a load of responses now, but I can see if more people are. Yeah, maybe we'll give it like two minutes or. Yeah, that's fine. What I can do is move on to our additional recommendations while people are making their commitments as this might give people some some more ideas as well um so oscar i know you've added a lot of resources that people can look at further to this training yeah so there's a couple of great books that you can get uh, in the trinity library as well because they're they're all there this is where i read them for the first time uh, so the first one transgender 101 a simple guide to a complex issue um it's a little bit older now but it's a phenomenal resource it really does go through the basics in a very uh, uh, accumulative way you will it's a short book you could finish it in an afternoon and it will really provide a great basis of understanding for what trans people experience um then finding masculinity is a book which is more suited for uh, masculine trans people in adulthood uh, a lot of resources are really only for young people or they're only for people who are quite early in their transition. So this book provides more of resources about what to do after being uh, transitioning for 10, 20, 30 years. How do I, um, how do I become a trans adult? Uh, so often we don't have representation for trans adults because we don't generally live that long. So now there's a new phenomenon of older transgender people and part of that is going to be sort of navigating how do how does faith work in transgender communities because there are transgender people who have a lot of faith uh, another book which is phenomenal and the author wonderful kate bornstein uh, gender outlaw on men women and the rest of us it's a beautiful artistic book um it's really passionate i would recommend any of kate bornstein's work she's also written a book um called um uh, 101 Reasons Not to Kill Yourself, I think it's the vague title of that, but it's a very practical uh, piece of literature for people in crisis. Uh, it's, it, it's I, th I think I can safely say that it has saved lives. Kate Bornstein is wonderful. And then there's a more recent reference. So what it feels like for a girl is Paris Lees that just came out this year. And that's from a trans feminine perspective. And it's came out this year, so it's, it's quite contemporary. Um, there's a couple of media pieces that you could look at as well. Um, Changing the Game is a documentary about trans inclusion in sports. You may have seen that today or yesterday, the first transgender person uh, qualified for the Olympics, uh, the first transgender person ever to qualify for the Olympics. Uh, so there's a documentary about how trans people interact with sports because there's a, a lot of misinformation about trans people in sports. Uh, Disclosure, I'm sure a lot of people have seen on their Netflix suggested uh, tiles. I would recommend watching it. It's, uh, it's intense but it's, it's really important. 
uh, it does a great job of explaining how media bias can influence the trans community at large and how cisgender people portraying trans roles in film is quite damaging and it is an act of violence and as a lot of people would consider it. Uh, then there's another uh, documentary called Growing Up Koi, and that's about a uh, trans uh, person in the States. They're quite young and they were then the subject of a legal battle to be able to attend school as their desired gender. Um, really interesting from a family perspective and from a youth perspective as well. And then there's a couple of additional trainings um, that you could attend. Uh, Shoutout is a wonderful organisation. They provide uh, educational corporate workshops. Uh, Tenny, the Trans Equality Network Ireland, I'm always a big fan. They have guides, resources, trainings. You can just call their phone line and chat to somebody. Uh, Belong to as well. They do a workplace training e-course. Uh, Belong to are focused more on youth uh, under the age of 25. So there might be a large population of the students who don't qualify for the Belong to supports. Okay, great. Thank you, Oscar, for for bringing us through the recommendations there. So what I might do, Courtney, if you've gathered some of the, the responses to the second survey. I yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, can everyone see that? Yes. Yeah. OK, perfect. You. OK, so we've got 31 responses, which is great. So even some of the responses here add pronouns to my email signature, um, make changes to some forms for the next academic year, run further training seminars for staff in our department, use visual aids such as flags, pins, etc. to show visual support, read more books by trans people, uh, to become more confident in engaging with the TCD transgender community. So we have really, really good responses and yeah, that's all really positive and I hope that yeah so it's there, great to see that to people learn. have uh, a desire to learn more from it and to understand that it's not all going to be done in the one hour um, and all of these uh, all of these items are going to practically assist people i saw somebody said that they're going to change the uh, make some changes to forms for the next academic year that's going to change people that's going to be really helpful and it seems very simple yeah. perfect my and some of those the commitments there, people saying that they're going to look into further training and continue to learn about the area. And I think that's hopefully that message got across today that, as Oscar has said, it's not something that you're transformed after just this session today, but something to constantly chip away at and become more aware of that seems to be reflected in some of these commitments here. OK. Great. So I suppose just looking, I know, Courtney, you were tasked with just keeping an eye on the Microsoft form if any questions were coming through there. There's a couple in the chat that we can get to as well. Yeah, so I um, might start with the chat questions first. I've got both my laptops up and got all the questions here. So the first question is, what is the first step in being more inclusive to transgender students? I would say that the first step you've already taken by attending this training, that is the first step to improve your knowledge um, and to open yourself up to that knowledge. In a practical sense, the first step that you could take, um, sorry, I'm gonna scroll back up so I can see it. Um, the first step that you could take is something that we've already said. You could just add your email uh, pronouns. Um, really simple, but primarily the first step that you wanna take is just more education. Just watch another documentary, attend another training. Um, this cumulative knowledge will eventually manifest in confidence in being able to be inclusive. Perfect. And I might just hop on to a question from the forum. So can you give guidance on how to cope with trans panic in the workplace? Staff have knee jerk reactions to trans issues in class, for example, dead naming and immediately apologise previously request training for all staff cohort cohorts presuming that staff don't have trans experience rather than calmly dealing with the situation from position of an ally yeah so that makes a lot of sense as well there is uh there, people do have a knee-jerk reaction to trans issues and the majority of that in my understanding stems from a lack of understanding because knowledge uh, fear only comes from a lack of understanding so the best way to sort of uh, change that would be to educate people if they're resistant to that education that can be complicated so in if you were in a classroom setting and somebody was having this um 
transplanic kind of rhetoric. Uh, first and foremost, you have to look to the students in the room and to support people who are in that moment in a crisis, um, because that then turns their educational space into an unsafe space. Uh, and the way to move beyond that is to implement mandatory trainings and to ensure that people are regularly updated on this and to let students know that if this happens, they have a place to go to and it is not OK. Students need to know that they would be supported in reporting an issue like this. Perfect. And then question in the chat. Is there a best practice when it comes to supporting or even advocating for transgender students when they encounter difficulties or more significant challenges? It can be complicated because there's a lot of um, like really intense trauma that somebody can be exposed to by the product of being transgender. And there's a lot of intense violence that you could be exposed to as well. And it's difficult for people to understand how to support those uh, those students. Uh, I myself, I was a victim of a hate crime. I was attacked in Dublin city centre and I had uh, my face kicked in. Uh, and when I returned to work, my employers didn't really know how to talk to me because people didn't want to say anything for fear of saying the wrong thing. Um, so it, when the more difficult things happen, what is more important than knowing everything is to be is to be open to listen to the person and to support them. Uh, they may not have appropriate avenues of support in other uh, aspects of their life. They may not have supportive family. They may not have a large network of friends or maybe their friends can't deal with the intense thing that's happening. Maybe they don't have the tools to be able to support them. If they have come to you and have said that this is a difficult thing I'm experiencing, it's vital that you take that seriously and don't anticipate that they've told somebody else that. If you don't know what to do, traditional crisis intervention is the way to go. Um, make sure someone is safe, make sure that they aren't at risk to themselves or others, uh, direct them to suicide hotlines, direct them to mental health supports, give them crisis intervention. Uh, it's not anticipated that every trans person has a large net to fall back on. And if you have become a person's net, um, first and foremost, feel proud that that is something that you've been able to manifest, but it's also a serious obligation. Um, it's it can be very difficult to deal with some of the more intense things. Um, so there's no direct answer to it, but it's more awareness and knowing where the crisis intervention points are. Just wondering how, mo how many more questions. Uh... There, we have it still a few more but yeah so I know we we said it would be an hour I can see the recordings just an hour now but maybe we'll take two more Courtney if that's okay okay uh perfect so this is quite a long question and the form so it says thanks for this talk it has been really interesting and suitably challenging I think just one question as the obligation is on us as staff to create a safe inclusive support environment for LGBTQ plus but it may not be obvious and we should not assume we are dealing with an LGBTQ plus student in some situations. Doesn't that potentially leave a chasm we need to bridge? And if so, how do we be, how do we bridge that gap in an inclusive way? Mm. For example, how do we identify the students who require the support? Is this is this by, as you say, by providing services broadly? I found that piece about creating a welcoming and a welcoming environment really useful. So any other tips on making the campus feel more welcoming to the community would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, so that, that's an excellent point about um, how do we bridge that chasm as well. Uh, creating the inclusive environment is that first step um, and that can be done in many, many ways. Uh, additionally, there can be other, uh, it can ju it, not just in your room, maybe the website that you have for your service can also have a space where it says very clearly, we support LGBT plus students. It doesn't have to be more than that. Uh, somebody searching online, thinking that they may go to Trinity, will see that and know that Trinity can be a safe space. One of the main reasons why I picked Trinity on my CAO was knowing that the student counselling service and psychological services, they had a section on gender identity. Um, like it was very brief, but no other university had that at the time. And it made me know that Trinity could be a space that I could go to. And ultimately it ended up as my first three options. Um, so being able to bridge that chasm can be quite difficult. And it also requires you individually to sort of expose yourself a little bit because you can't anticipate somebody opening themselves up to you and then you don't do the same. Um, so sharing a little bit, or I, I'm not saying that everybody has to come out to everybody, 
but there is a, a little bit of love that you could give when you're interacting with someone that can let them know that it's more of an open space and it might invite them to be more open with you. Okay, we might share the last question is in the chat and yeah, so how best do we advocate for a change, for example, preferred name, visually accessible for on registers? Yeah, um, there's, there's loads of ways to advocate for change. Uh, it depends on which systems you're uh, also with online classes. Yeah, that, I'll, point one and then I'll come to point two. Um, attending trainings like this, uh, building your knowledge and then bringing that back to your systems and then integrating it into your systems. So there is, uh, in the gender identity and expression policy, there is uh, information about advocating for preferred names. Uh, also on the note of that, uh, uh, of that language, we tend to say, um, name just on its own uh, preferred name implies that it's optional um, which is just another one of those language things that we sometimes need to check ourselves up on um, so especially on the registers item because a lot of people have to sign into their classes and then they'll immediately be outed or their old name will be shown so it's about uh, re reorganizing the systems that trinity use it's very easy to print a different name on a document but it may require an extra step in downloading the student file and then amending it before printing it there's, uh, think about the processes that are already, yes, think about the processes that are already there and think about how they can be changed or how they can be amended slightly. And then in terms of the, the online classes, that's really difficult because uh, students may not be in a supportive environment. They may not be able to speak openly. And I think that would be true in a lot of different instances or a lot of different issues in the remote learning space. People may not feel comfortable talking about a lot of things. Uh, yes, I can explain dead naming. Um, so there's a risk of outing somebody unintentionally. It's important then that if you are concerned about that, to try and change how you're interacting with the person. If you can, if there's somebody definitely looking over their shoulder, now is not the time and place to do that. A private email separately may uh, be a bit more appropriate. Asking somebody how is their home situation, um, and then acting on it. Or even if you're doing a live class feedback and you're expecting people to speak. Uh, you can also say at the beginning of the session that we understand that not everybody can speak as freely as they might be able to do in a seminar room. Maybe you can send in your notes additionally in text. Maybe you can do something outside of class time and then feed back into it. Um, the, the idea of dead naming, um, it's referring to somebody by the name that they no longer use. Um, so if you have a Trinity email address, your Trinity student email address is made up of a combination of your first name and your last name, some variation thereon. You might get a number at the end if somebody already has it, but those two things come from your uh, registered student name and your surname, and they're difficult to change. But that means that my Trinity student email has the CAO name that I used, which is no longer my name. So that meant that every time that I used my Trinity email, I was dead naming myself and outing myself. I was then able to change the settings, though it no longer showed the old name, but the email address is still the same uh, first name, last name. Um, is there something else? I started putting the name first registered as the department is the other way around. Yeah, referring to people by their surnames is also uh, a very simple thing that you could do if you uh, don't want to risk using the wrong name. If you refer to all your students by their surname, it's a little bit more informal. Um, I know that one of my uh, previous uh, interactions with education, I was working in um, a summer camp. We would give nicknames to everyone. It was just easier. Uh, and a lot of the children that were gender diverse would just change their nickname every couple of days. But there's, there's creative ways that you can uh, engage with people that doesn't single them out as being different. Also, none of this is, uh, uh, this is, don't take everything I say as gospel. I'm but just one trans person. I don't speak for the entire community. These things come from my experiences and my accumulated knowledge over the past 10 years. And um, there might be some other trans person who use uh, uses totally different recommendations. OK, great. Thank you, Oscar, for for the insight. And as you said, that's that's your perspective. Extremely valuable to hear, though. Um, so thank you. And, and again, just to bring it back, there is a lot of really useful information in the Trinity Gender Identity and Expression Policy already. Um, so I really would suggest going back, taking a look through to see where you might lie within that. Um, there's a really nice flow chart and checklists of things to consider if a student does come to you seeking support in 
you know, any of the, the steps on their transition or, you know, even outside of that. So that's a really good place as well to go to maybe after this training. Um, so I think we're going to wrap it up there. This session, as we know, is being recorded um, and the recording is going to be uploaded to the Disability Service website and we'll circulate it on our social media channels as well.